<clears throat> yeah. All right, so <laughs> pray that I don't go into one of my coughing fits. Um, I can kind of feel the uh, tickle in my throat, so pray that that doesn't come about. <coughs> All right, so let's open up to Romans. Romans chapter 3. We're going to go f- mostly through 3. We're not really going to touch on 4 too much, um, just simply because it's, this, it's the story of Abraham's faith. And then my mic is bugging me. Okay. <coughs> Um, So you guys can read that. It is impactful. It is good. Not saying that it's not, but um, we're going to be focusing mostly on chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 is about God's faithfulness. Uh, If you remember last week, last week was kind of a a, a tougher one that was talking about God's wrath and uh, judgmentalism and all kinds of stuff. And if you, if you don't remember, you weren't here, Romans is more or less a legal argument for the faith and how that is supposed to look in the Jewish culture and how the relationship between Jews and Gentiles works. Um, <coughs> that kind of stuff. Bobby, let, are you ready? No, I'm talking about my uh, thing. <coughs> All right, so let's skip to verse 5 in Romans. It does connect, but we're starting at verse 5. Where's the laser pointer? Can you see it? It's up in the corner. Presentation, top right, present, down a little bit, over to the left a little bit, down. There you go. All right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we're getting into more of, we're going to talk a lot about salvation today because this is really where God's righteousness comes out and how uh, in this first passage, as soon as I'm able to read it, <coughs> maybe one of these days, can you switch it for me? Because it's not switching. Okay. (coughs) Maybe it'll let me know. No, it won't. Okay, anyway, verse 5, let's read it together. But if your unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? (coughs) But if God, or that God is unjust in bringing his wrath, I'm using the human argument. Certainly not. If that, if that were so, how could God judge the world, someone might argue. If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness, and so in, <clears throat> gosh, God's truthfulness, and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we... As we are being slanderous reported, slanderously reported as saying and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. So this passage is referring to our interaction with sin. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I will probably need it. In many minds, um, <laughs> that's okay. It happens. It happens. Okay. Some may it, it, some use this passage. Some may think we don't have to necessarily worry about sin after we have become saved, and this is what this is talking about, and how. 
we are not righteous ever by what we do. The actions that we do do not make us righteous or not. And that's what this is, that's what this is talking about. And it's making the argument, um, it's making the argument that only God can give his righteousness. We cannot earn it. We cannot, uh, <coughs> yeah, in other words, we just can't earn it. No matter what we do, we will always be seen as unrighteous. And that will never, never change. Um, without Christ, of course, but we're getting to that. <laughs> we're getting to that in a few minutes. Um, so while it may be true to some extent that we can follow the law, and that, makes, that may, may help us make us a good person and so on and so forth, it still does not make us righteous. If we go on to the next uh, section, chapter, or verse 9, it says, We shall conclude then. <clears throat> are we any better? So are we any better than people that are not saved? The answer is, not at all. Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are alike and all under sin. So as Christians, we are still under sin. We are in the Gentiles category, if you do not know that. Um, we are still bound by sin. Even, even as saved individuals, we still deal with sin. We still deal with sin. And it drives me nuts. Drives me absolutely crazy. I came from the Church of God Anderson background. They typically, don't, they typically don't teach this, but some of the teachings, people get it in their heads that eventually, once they're sanctified, they don't deal with sin anymore. And that's just a lie. Um, and it's not that, like I said, it's not that the Church of God necessarily even teaches that. But sometimes, and the Nazarene is the same way, you see some people in there, it's like, oh, I haven't sinned since, like, 1955. And it's like, are you kidding me? Seriously. It's like, you just sinned right there because you lied about it. <laughs> but I have heard that many, many a time. And that's not necessarily, you know, Nazarene and Church of God, they're not necessarily wrong in what they teach as far as being holy and trying to become holy and being sanctified. But there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes our mind twists those theologies into making us think, oh, I haven't sinned since I was sanctified. And yeah, no, that's not, no. And, it, and it's, not, it's not a far stretch either. It's not. Uh, just like every Muslim converted Christian that I've ever heard says, it's not a far stretch from radical to not. It's not a far stretch. And uh, so it, it, goes, it goes the same way. And that's almost like saying that you haven't sinned is almost kind of like radicalism in a way. Um, now it's not violently radicalism, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> All right, so we're moving on to Psalms 14, because this is what <laughs> he quotes it. Psalms 14, uh, 1 through 3, says, it's also Romans. You don't have to turn to Psalms. It's right there in Romans. He quotes it. You're good. All right, so there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. <clears throat> there is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open, <coughs> are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The, prison of vi or the poison of vipers on their lips, and their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And ruin, and ruin, misery, uh, mark their ways in the way of peace they do not know. 
There is no fear of God before their eyes. Do you guys see yourselves in any of that? I mean, even if it's just in your mind, like, I see myself in that. Like, there's a lot of times where I am not seeking what God wants, where I am saying poisonous things to someone. Uh, Whether they realize it or not, sometimes I don't even realize it. Or thinking negatively about other people for whatever reason. Because this this goes to thoughts, too. Jesus makes it very clear that our thoughts matter. And we can sin without, with just thinking about stuff. (coughs) So I don't know about you, but I definitely see myself in that passage. Let's go on to, no, we're on 19. Okay. (coughs) Now we know that whatever the law says, it says those who are under the law who are under the law, uh, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in the sight, in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Okay, so he's saying the law does have a purpose. And the purpose is to, for us to be conscious of what God wants, of what of he, that's a guiding force. It's not necessarily, and if you don't know what the law is, if any of you read the book of Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy and some of those, uh, you know, the laws, he's talking, he's referring to the Jewish law. More specifically, he's referring to the Ten Commandments, and uh, that's, the law <laughs> that he's talking about because he's talking with, to Jews, he's talking to Gentiles. Gen- they all know, they have some knowledge of what the law is. And uh, so that's what he's talking about. More or less, you can consider it rules in, uh, in our... Because we have, as Christians, we have kind of like an unspoken set of rules. You know, don't smoke, don't drink, don't lie, cheat, steal. Those are like general rules that most of them are biblical. But at the same time, it's not about what we do, but why we do them. It's about the relationship. We may choose most of the rules that are set up, the law, are meant to protect us from the nastiness of the world. Because, I don't know about you guys, but where does typically drugs lead you? It leads you down to a path of destruction. So why is that rule set up? So we don't go down that path of destruction. You know, sexual sin, why are those rules set up? So we don't go down a path of destruction. That's why the law is there. And what, and what this is saying is that God allows us to see why we don't do those certain things. He allows us to see it, but it is not in itself the mode to salvation that, unfortunately, a lot of people think it is. And by a lot of people, I mean probably the majority of Christians. (laughs) Um. And it's easy, it's really easy to get caught up in that. Really easy. Because law is an earthly made thing. Rules are earthly made things. And it's so easy to get caught up in, well, if I don't do this, that makes me a better person. Does it? (laughs) It might for a short time, but it's not going to change your whole heart's direction or your... Um, now, that being said, if you quit smoking, it will change your financial direction. I mean, geez, it's like getting a pay raise if you quit some of these things that cost you a lot of money. And I'm not talking just smoking. Jeez, if you don't drink pop, it changes your financial direction. Um, and your health. <laughs> 
um, <clears throat> you know, I have those, it, it's kind of funny, I have, Kayla and I never buy pop. In fact, 99% of the time we drink water, which is fine. Um, but a couple of weekends ago, I drank, because I was at someone else's house or whatever, I drank pop a couple of times. Man, it, I was like, man, I don't feel good. When you don't, <laughs> when you don't drink it and then you do, it, it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> all, in, all in moderation, I guess, right? And as far as pop goes. You don't want to get caught addicted to certain things and, and have to be. Because remember, sin is things that distract us from God, at least in my definition. Um, and that can be literally <laughs> literally anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you'd be, you'd be amazed uh, some of the studies that are out nowadays with people that are "Quote unquote addicted to Facebook um, and and other things, where if they s- they've done studies where they just had people stop for a couple of months, like totally stop, and their and uh, their thoughts and their the way that they think totally changes because they're not constantly getting that dopamine from reading other people's gossip." Um, it's it's amazing uh, some of the stuff they've done, <coughs> and they've done s- similar studies on porn too, um, where they've had people that they totally took them away from that for several months if they had been looking at it before, and they actually their work performance improved, their like mental their intelligence actually improves over those two months. They feel better about themselves and the people around them. It's a, it's amazing some of the stuff that they're coming out with now, and they're studying how people's mentalities change just by taking away what they're addicted to. Um, and uh, so, that being said. <coughs> That being said, how does that interact with our lives and with the rules? There are probably rules in faith-wise that you read and that God and you work out and set for yourself. That's fine. Because our individual relationship, you will find things. God doesn't want you to do this, even if there's nothing wrong with it. But you you decide not to do it because you love God. God, you love your relationship with Christ. That's why these rules work. That's why we do these rules that are lined out in Scripture. Not only do they not send us down the path of destruction, but we do them. Be- we don't do them because we love Christ and we want to be like Him. And He didn't do them. Now. Moving on, verse 21. But now, and this is where it gets cool, but now, so we've talked about sin, we've talked about law, now the righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to... All who believe, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You guys have heard that one before, right? Yeah, that's a very, very common one. And are justified, (coughs) and are (coughs) justified freely (coughs) by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Do I need to move on yet? Okay. <clears throat> through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did not, or he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to be just, 
and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So, there's not really a whole lot to add to that. <laughs> there's not really a whole lot more to add to that, but um, what he's saying here is the righteousness comes through your faith in Christ. And God did this to wash away, for those who believe in him, to wash away all of the sin, to wash away all that unrighteousness, and gives us his righteousness. Because remember, no one's righteous by themselves. But God freely gave his righteousness as, our, as a gift he took the punishment. He took the punishment for what we should be taking the punishment for. That's what this is saying. <clears throat> now you guys, most of you know that already. But that's what the gospel is. It's believing it's believing and God taking that constant sin mentality that we are in, taking it and paying for it. And all we have to do is believe. If you never pray the prayer, <laughs> technically speaking, the prayer is not necessarily even biblical. It's just that you have to surrender. To, you, to God. You have to believe and surrender to Christ. Um, it does not require some uh, scripted prayer. It just requires you to surrender yourself. Now granted, the scripted prayer talks about that, but it is not, it's not about the prayer that's scripted or someone else praying it over you. You have to make the decision yourself. You have to do that. No one else can do it for you. You can't ride the coattails of your parents. It's all individual. <clears throat> and I know it's difficult in our, in our culture today that's so collective-minded, but it's the truth. <laughs> you can't ride anybody else's coattails. Because if you don't have that relationship with God, he is not paying for your sins. You will be. And are sometimes. Sometimes we pay for our sins on earth. A lot of times we pay for our sins on earth. But we will definitely pay for them in heaven too. If we don't get right with God. <clears throat> Twenty-seven. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that observing the law. <clears throat> on that of observing the law. No one on that faith, or on, on that of faith, no, sorry, no, but on that of faith, for we maintain that the man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Do you, do you guys see how it's separate? How observing the law is separate than him paying for our sins? Do you guys see how that's different? Okay. All right. <clears throat> is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not... Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith? But do we then nullify the law by his faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Okay, so Paul's talking about, in this later portion uh, God's talking about how Jews and Gentiles in God's eyes are more or less the same. Um, 
He treats them the same, okay? So <laughs> we don't have to have a bloodline of Jewish heritage to accept Christ. And that's what Paul, Paul argues this point a lot because this is a big issue in the early church because Jesus even said, I came for the Jews first, and he did. But that's not to say that the Gentiles aren't important um, because even God before Christ wanted to spread the word to other cultures. You guys remember Jonah? The Ninevites were not Jewish. In fact, they were very pagan. <laughs> very pagan. And what did Jonah do? He didn't want to go because why? It wasn't, they weren't Jews. So he was scared for his life. He was scared for a lot of different things. But God went ahead and used him anyway. And the pagans of Nineveh actually came around. They actually came around. They <coughs> and a lot of people uh, followed God after that from Nineveh. Um, now, granted, in the timeline of, of history, it wasn't too long after that that the and Nineveh was the capital of a of a group called the Assyrians, and it wasn't long after that that the Assyrian Empire collapsed. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> I mean, it could have very well been that was a turning point because the Assyrians were very brutal, very, very brutal. And I'm really getting on a side note here. Um, yeah, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to know some of the torture methods that they used. But they did some really cool things too. Um, they actually took over, wow, I'm really getting off. Um, they actually took over an island called Phoenicia, which was a trading island. And they would constantly, they were very, very wealthy. They, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, they built a land bridge from around the Israel-Jordan area of the Mediterranean to that island. A land bridge. They would have had to move a lot of dirt. <laughs> no one knows how they did that, but <laughs> they did it, and they conquered Phoenicia for it. But that's neither here nor there. That's free history lesson right there. But anyway, <laughs> back to the topic. Um, <clears throat> this is why history is awesome and how actually having a knowledge of history helps me anyway explore the Bible because you, can, you know what's happening about the time that this stuff is going on. So when they mention, say that you read Jonah and you, and you have an idea of who the Ninevites were, it brings the story to life. You know the kind of torture methods and things like that. And that goes, for, that goes for New Testament times as well. If you know what's going on in the Roman Empire at the time that Paul writes Romans, it opens up a whole new picture of why he says the things that he does. Does that make sense? Yeah. So... And this is one of the greatest history books ever written because, and I don't know if you guys have ever uh, done studies on it, but they constantly, the Bible is constantly proving itself as an accurate history book. Constantly. People doubt it, and then archaeologists, like, they'll read parts of the Bible and they'll find, oh, this, oh, Israel was over here, not here. Oh, Okay. <laughs> it, or Jer Jerusalem was over here at that point. All right, well, that makes sense, I guess. But anyway, they're constantly, constantly finding things that are proving the Bible correct and not the other way around, which just blows my mind. But anyway, back to, <clears throat> back to the task at hand. Um, Paul is writing this to a people that, remember, he's writing this to a people he hasn't met with yet. So he's making sure that they understand the distinction uh, of what the law 
and ministering to Gentiles and so on and so forth. Most of the people in Rome at the time, the Christians, were Gentiles. So he wanted them to, in this particular instance, he wanted them to know that salvation for them was not any different than salvation for Jews. It's the same faith that's required. It's the same. It's exactly the same. And, that, and we can, what we can take out of that is no matter what we are going through in life, it's the same process for us as it is for Joe Blow off the street. It's the same process. No matter what our financial state is, no matter what our living conditions are, it's the same process for us to accept Christ as it is for anyone else. It's exactly the same. And that's important, really, really important to remember because if you're saved, you've been the guy at Joe Blow on the street that doesn't know anything. You've been that person before. And at the same time, that is your testimony. I was just like you, and God changed my life. Your story is the most, is the easiest um, story. It's the easiest one for you to tell how God changed you. And guess what? No one can argue with your experience. They just can't. So our stories... If you, have, if you have a relationship with God already, it's your story that will bring more people. It's your story that will bring the Holy Spirit into people's lives. And even if it's a super lame testimony, like I was saved when I was in third grade and just really have never totally turned away from it, that's, that's my story. But I can tell you, I've went through struggles, and God has helped me through those. I've went through a lot of different things that can allow me to relate to people, even though I've been a person of faith for pretty much my whole life. But at the same time, that can be as effective to some people as, as a story of redemption from drugs, alcohol, etc., now, granted, there are people that the stories of drugs, alcohol, etc., um, can reach the people with drugs, alcohol, etc., that I can't because I've never really experienced that side of life. Um, <clears throat> but, but that doesn't say that my testimony is any worse than anybody else's. So if you have a quote-unquote lame testimony like mine, that's okay. Your story still works because <laughs> God's continuing to mold you into the person that, that he wants you to be. And we have to believe in him and believe that he will mold us to the person that we... <clears throat> um, chapter 4, I want to touch on it a little bit. I don't want to go highly into it, but I want you to read it. Um, I do want you to read chapter 4 this week. Uh, it's talking about Abraham's faith and how that relates to what we do and how Abraham was justified and, and seen as righteous in God's eyes even long, long before Christ. So <laughs> he continues his more or less legal argument um, about covering sin through grace and, and talking about that. Um, but I, I, as sermon-wise, I saw it as kind of repetitive. So, and I wanted to dwell more on the salvation issue than what, um, because that's so important, guys. So, so important. If you haven't, if you have accepted Christ and you just kind of got away, then it's time to turn back. If you haven't ever accepted Christ, it's time to do that.
it's time. You cannot wait. You can't afford to wait. Financially or otherwise. <laughs> you cannot afford to wait. Um, not saying... Because God makes us rich in other ways other than money. But now granted, I am a person that if you do handle money God's ways, then he will bless you financially. Um, however, however, that is a totally separate issue from salvation. Salvation is far more important. Far more important. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for every person in this room. And we thank you for Paul and the ability to write the way that he did and to, uh, to argue the point of salvation and talking about uh, how you are the one that makes us righteous. It's nothing that we do. It's just you. And you're the only one that can make us righteous in your sight. Help us to remember that this week. Help us to make that decision to follow you in the thick and in the thin. It's, it's funny. It seems like uh, when we accept you into our lives, it seems like <laughs> the first several months are pretty crazy. And even turning back to you after being walking, as, going astray for a little bit, it seems like uh, things go crazy for a little bit. And that's okay. We, we just pray for strength and guidance through those times, Lord, and th that we can overcome the worldliness that we live constantly. Help us to be in the world and not of it. love you. We thank you for all you do, and in your name we pray.